Welcome everyone to the FPSA Packaging Network Sharing Knowledge Series. We're kicking off the 2024-2025 series with recyclable packaging. Our first topic as part of this series in the, uh, the recycling packaging series is solving for better circularity in fiber-based packaging recycling. We'll get started off today by introducing you to our moderators. Uh, moderating today are Katie Ireland and myself. Um, Katie, I'd like to uh, welcome you and thank you for joining us. Uh, Katie is our Packaging Network co-chair on the Net Packaging Network and our subject matter expert in packaging. Uh, Katie serves at CRB, where she serves as a principal packaging engineer. Thank you, Nehemiah. I am pleased to introduce Nehemiah White. Uh, he is joining me as a fellow packaging network member and subject matter expert, and works at Enritsu as a regional sales manager. Thank you everyone for joining us today as we learn and share together. Okay, I think we've settled in. Okay, so let's get started. A little bit about um, the packaging network. Uh, today is our first series topic, and we are excited to bring to you a panel discussion on solving for better circularity in fiber-based package recycling. The packaging network is a part of FPSA, the Food Production Solutions Association. We're proud to bring current educational opportunities to this network and beyond. The primary goal of this recyclable packaging series is to share information and bring clarity to what can be recycled and what cannot be recycled, both locally and globally, in addition to exploring how we can make recycling more prevalent by removing and reducing waste throughout our ecosystem. Lastly, we're asking this question, how can we all improve the overall recycling process? Our first topic is paper and fiber-based recycling. We will be spotlighting a different packaging material recycling process on a quarterly basis. So stay tuned for our future offerings. Now, here's our agenda for today. First, we'll get started with an introduction of our incredible panelists. Then we'll proceed to a series of questions for our panelists with a round robin format that should last about 40 minutes. And then we'll round everything out with a Q&A. During the panel interview, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen so that our panelists can answer them during the final Q&A. All right, and lastly, a fun fact to start us off. Paper recycling is one of the oldest recycled material processes. In 1031, Japan recycled and made paper. We want to explore with you today, as processes have evolved, what are the current challenges in fiber-based package paper recycling, and how do we design and support efforts to make the process better? Let's meet our panelists. Well, first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Staub and welcome her. Uh, Elizabeth is the Global Packaging Sustainability Manager for HB Fuller. Elizabeth has over 15 years of experience in business-to-business -business marketing management and team leadership in the food and beverage packaging industry. Her focus is on strategic planning, product portfolio, and innovation management that all bring forth new product solutions for a more sustainable, circular future in packaging. Elizabeth believes there's a sustainable future for consumer packaging with a better solution for our well-being on this planet that is economically viable. Elizabeth, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. And let's welcome Lon Shigoda. Welcome, Lon. The general manager of Western Michigan University's prestigious paper pilot plants. Lon leads business development and strategy and manages the pilot plant business. Lon's background in specialty papers, coded recycled board, integrated packaging and natural binders serve him well to tackle the wide variety of projects that come through the door at Western Michigan University. Lon is an active leader in the industry as part of TAPI committees and as a subject matter expert for the ISO TC6 working group for Evergreen, 
and the Next Gen Cup Challenge, along with McDonald's, Starbucks, and Pepsi, and the Next Gen Composting Consortium. Having me. Thank you. Next up. Thank you. Uh, next up is Blake Gordon, the general manager of digital training at Georgia Pacific Recycling, where he leads customer experience and commercial excellence initiatives. With a tenured background in innovation, all the way from corporates down to startups, Blake and his team navigate the evolving landscape of recycling, fostering growth, and ensuring Georgia Pacific Recycling remains at the forefront of sustainable business practices. Blake's career trademark has been a relentless commitment to customer satisfaction and the development of strategic solutions that directly address their needs. Blake, really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And lastly, we want to welcome Brad Kurzanowski. Welcome, Brad. Brad is the Fiber Manager at Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Brad joined the nonprofit Green Blue as a Sustainable Packaging Coalition's Fiber Manager in March of this year. Prior to joining the SPC, Brad was a consultant with Resource Recycling Systems, helping to lead the organization's corporate sustainability and packaging focused work. His combination of professional and academic experience provided clients a unique perspective on the intersection of packaging sustainability and resource management. He received his BS and MS from Michigan State University School of Packaging. Go green. All right. Got the last name spot on too. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right, so without further ado, we are going to kick off with our panel questions. And we're gonna start with this first question uh, to Lon. What do you experience as the biggest challenge today in recycling fiber-based packaging? And what is your number one solve for this challenge? Yep, so I would start by just framing up the issue a little bit more. So here in the US, depending on the source that you look at, we're between 60 and 70% recovery rate uh, for our fiber-based paper products here. Uh, World-class um, countries are 80 to 85%. And just for reference, the Forever Green effort uh, is to be 90% globally by 2030. So uh, that would certainly be world class. Um, so, and just to, to frame that up a little more, the 30% approximately that we don't recover here in the US is about 20 million pieces. So there's a considerable amount of fiber that we still do not capture. Um, I do have to say for, for base materials, uh, paper is among the best in, in many cases by a long shot, uh, but there is still some room to improve on that. Uh, and that, that challenge is actually becoming more and more difficult as we see people here uh, working through our facility to innovate on new packaging and uh, the implementation of new materials into that paper stream. So we start talking about bioplastics and laminates and metallized foils. Uh, it is getting actually more, more difficult to sort and capture some of those new products that are coming out. So great innovations, uh, but because of their size and shape and density, some of those can be more and more difficult to capture. So kind of the overarching improvements going back to consumer behavior, you know, we need to do better there. And then collections and short sortation uh, need to improve. But what, what I tend to focus on here is, those, is, is uh, integrating those new materials into the package. Um, and, and what I would say for the number one solve uh, would be as people, as companies are inter innovating to do that alongside a certifying body like ourselves um, to help guide uh, the implementation of the, those new materials, just to have some guide rails. It's just a shame to see somebody innovate and come out with a great package uh, and be a year into um, you know, innovation and come back and find out that it's not recyclable and it's because this material was chosen or because of the way uh, it's adhered or, or whatever it might be. So I would say, you know, pull people into your network, um, do some early stage testing uh, around the recyclability and, and not a full certification, but do some testing up front of raw materials uh, to help guide uh, the, the implement, implementation of new materials. Great, thank you. Do we have another panelist that would like to share? Yeah, I'll chime in and, and kind of yes and to what Lam was saying, right? It's it's communication, it's education, and it's information, right? 
it has to, in order for it to be captured, in order for it to make it into the recycling stream, somebody has to put it in the right bin, unfortunately, right? Uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but there is so much disparity when we get to, you know, certainly there's the fact of the material itself, right? And how is the material comprised? What's, what's the composition? Can those layers be separated? All that kind of good stuff. Um, but then there's the nuance within the recycling uh, stream as, as a whole, right? You have uh, MRFs, material recovery facilities, recycling plants, whatever you want to call them, right? Uh, that have different technologies. They have varying levels of uh, investment. They may be a private MRF, they may be a public MRF. And it may be that when I put my blue bin out at the curb with all my materials in it, you know, uh, five miles down the road, my neighbor might go to a completely different MRF. It might go through a different hauler that takes different materials that can, that can sort different things that has, uh, you know, different camera systems. Right. So then it's, 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 uh, we put the consumer in this case, the, you know, the residential person who is putting in the bin, we put them in a, a bad spot of the answer to, can I recycle this is it depends. And it depends on so many factors. And, and we don't have a, we don't have any kind of regulation behind it, any kind of consistency. We don't have a great access to information for them. There's some great companies like CERT and such like that. That's can I recycle this CIRT. They're doing a great job of, of helping people get just in time information, but it really is a confusing system that we've given to them. Right. So then you go one step further. I think you add new innovations, which are fantastic. But then it's confusing the MRFs, right? They don't know what this material is. So it, it's all about, I think, a communication, a breakdown of communication, a breakdown of information access, and a breakdown of education at the end. It, and it's a, it's a real uphill battle, honestly. Okay, that's a great point. Education is going to help with this as well. Do we have- I'd just like to add to that from, a, from an adhesive um, point of view. We really see though coming onto that topic of innovation. We see more and more innovations uh, coming in that space. Um, the wonderful new word word creation of uh, paperization in the industry, really trying to replace various plastic applications, plastic packaging applications with fiber-based applications. Those innovations are really going to add um, more challenges to the mix. We, um, an additional uh, sort of question mark for the consumer, Do I, can I put that into the recycling bin or not? Um, and that's then again where the communication comes into play. And of course, as producers, we need to test and make sure that they indeed can be recycled in the mills that, that are available. Um, so it's really the communication and there are many initiatives, um, the how to recycle, the CERT and various other apps that are uh, really making a lot of progress, but getting consumers to then actually use them is the is the second step. And doing that on a consistent basis, of course, is um, is a tough one. And I think it starts with um, with schools, you know, with kids. When I look at my kids and they say, "Well, mom, that's not going to go in that bin. You have to put it. You have to put it in the other one." Um, I think the the kids sort of learning um, from an early age can really make a difference there. Mm. And Katie, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump onto that as well at the end there. Um, for those for those that are unfamiliar with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, we are under the umbrella of Green Blue, the nonprofit, which also runs the How to Recycle label. And I think to the points that have brought, been brought up to the, by the panelists so far, um, you know, accurate and, and kind of consistent labeling can really help make sure that the right things are going in the bin. On the flip side, I think it's equally important to label things that should not be going in the bin. And so I think it's on companies mm -hmm. to both, you know, work with folks like Lon to go through, you know, their recyclability testing at WMU, but accurately and consistently label their packaging to ensure we're not, you know, gunking up the stream with things that shouldn't be going in there. Great, thank you. Our next question, guys, th that was a fantastic discussion. Great way to kick it off. I think it was really relevant to the lives that all of us live. I have my own kids that <laughs> will tell me after coming home from school what to recycle and what not to. So that communication piece of being a, a, a solve for this issue is really important. Um, 
Um, Brad, I'm going to kick this one off with you. Um, what parts or components of a fiber-based package are impacting or contaminating the recycling process? And I think this one will get, kind of get back to some of what you just ended with, actually. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nehemiah. Um, so I, uh, I'll start by saying I don't think I quite have some of the technical chops that other analysts do when it comes to things like repulping and further steps up the recycling stream. Most of my experience with fiber recyclability comes from working in uh, material recovery facilities, the recycling facilities that you know, Blake was alluding to uh, earlier during the first question. And um, I think generally speaking, when you think about like fiber bales in a, in a MRF like that, anything that's ending up in there that is not fiber has the potential to impact fiber recyclability or reprocessability or reprocessing. Um, and I think that both includes, you know, components of a fiber package as well as, you know, other types of packaging that are packaging that's going into the MRF. So um, when we sort material in these facilities, it's generally done by dimensions. So your 2D materials, your papers go one way and your, your 3D containers, oftentimes plastic, go another way. When we have materials that go into these facilities and act two-dimensionally, good example would be like plastic films or maybe a lightweight water bottle that's uncrushed. It's really easy for those materials to flow into a paper bale and cause contamination and issues down the line. Um, I think, and you know, Juan may be able to speak to this a little bit better than I can. There's some, you know, amount that's tolerable, but any of that that's ending up in a, you know, reprocessing, repulping system needs to be managed. It needs to be pulled out and managed as waste. So I think, you know, in MRFs as best as possible, eliminating that source of other packaging that can contaminate and that goes back to the communication and not putting things in the bin that shouldn't be going there um but then when looking at a package itself i think you know making it as mono material as possible i know that's a lot easier said than done but when you don't add additional non-fiber pieces to a package it's a lot easier to reduce the contamination thank you yeah. what are thoughts we have there um i think there's uh quite a bit of work going on there and just referencing um, the work that uh, the Forever Green is also doing and H.P. Fuller is also a member of Forever Green looking more specifically at the testing protocol and the scorecard evaluation. But in terms of the, the components, there's also um, different levels of technology that um, the mills are equipped with, different um, uh, different machinery, which can handle different types of um, contamination. Some will have a de-inking station, some will not. Some are able to recycle liquid beverage cartons, for example, example. others are not. So that pre-sortation in terms of having um, high quality material streams is absolutely, is absolutely essential. Um, and as Brad was just mentioning, anything that ends up at the recycling facility in the in the paper mill that doesn't need to be there then needs to be dealt with as a waste and that's of course an economic cost to the paper mill that do, they do not want to be engaging um, with so then one um, sort of enters that discussion how much more material do you want to be able to collect and recycle and are you then increasing the percentage of contamination and then increasing the costs on the other side because you have more rejects that you have to be dealing with, but overall you've been collecting more material. So there's probably a sweet spot in there in terms of saying how much more can I collect, but still collect in such a way that I have high quality materials that are being put into the, the paper mills, into the recycling process that then can be used um, efficiently rather than having um, a large amount of rejects that then have to be put into landfill or taken care of in other ways. That's really good. You're good, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Blake. I was just gonna say, that's really good. It's, it sounds like some of that kind of stuff starts with the manufacturer of the making the choice of what to put in that fiber-based packaging uh, to make sure they're solving for the issue before it even gets in the field. Absolutely. And just if I may, if I may add to that, um, the, the number that gets thrown around at many of these packaging conferences is that 80% of the carbon footprint and the environmental impact of a package is determined at the design stage. So very much um, getting all those parties around the table at the beginning of the process to say, how is my package going to be produced? 
how is the consumer going to use it? What type of convenience features do you need? And then what is the end of life scenario? What is the infrastructure in a specific region in a country in order to be able to take care of that is absolutely essential. That's great. Brad, feel free to go ahead and uh, pitch in here. Yeah, so this is kind of to, to ladder on to the point that we're, we're, we're making here and not to belabor it, but when you think about the recycling market as a whole, um, there has to be demand, there has to be a buyer that can use that product profitably, right? So when Brad was talking about other things, so not just the components of the layers of the material, right? That, that's a hard enough challenge. But then when you add in things like tape and labels and all these other kind of things that come along with the fiber, what that does is it degrades the value of that bale. Yeah, it changes the grade actually in our market, you know, so from an OCC 12 to an OCC 11 or something, or, you know, uh, or a mixed bale, that kind of stuff, right? Because what happens at the end is then there's just more hands that have to touch it. There's there's more processing that has to be done. There's more effort that has to go into it to get it down to the fiber that you need, the clean fiber that you need to make certain products. So the you know the dirtier these streams can be, the the more things that are in the stream, whether it be due to a lack of understanding when it was put in or um, poor investment, uh, you know poor filtering, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong along the way, unfortunately, that can make that bale a lower quality. And quality is a huge issue in the recycling market, um, especially when it comes to consistency of quality. When you're dealing, when, when you're buying from a certain MRF or transfer station or uh, supplier in general, it's, uh, you know, what level of, of detail did they put into scrutinizing that bale before I buy it? Because I'm going to find out one way or the other, and it's going to cost me a lot more finding it out later and putting having to put forth a lot more effort into this bale, right? But, but we have to be mindful that in order for the recycling market to work as a whole, there has to be value there. It, it can't just be at a net loss. I mean, it, there's the cost of landfilling waste, like was mentioned, and, and all that too. Right. So that's good. It seems it sounds like that kind of gets back to the economic point that Elizabeth was making earlier is that this is an important conversation, not just for the people making and recovering these materials, but also for the end user. Because if your recovery costs go way high because you're lacking quality, then our costs as the consumers are going to go up, which should motivate us to improve our recycling habits. Absolutely. And and that's a big problem in using, you know, so when we think about things like the plastics industry, right, that's where uh, it's a lot easier to lean into virgin material. But that also creates a lot more waste, right? So mm -hmm. it, it is a, uh, it's all about an economics at the end of the day. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have many people that are leaning more into circularity and, and clean operations green operations, but, you know, unfortunately the market as a whole comes down to economics. Yeah, that's good. It's a circular economics. Sure. Alon, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, a lot of different ways this could go and a great discussion and a lot of good <laughs> points there. Um, but I mean, when we, we talk about contaminants in, in paper, it's basically anything that's not fiber. So what we look for when we do that testing, you know, the kind of the ideal and the ideal uh, breakdown of that structure would either be that those contaminants stay large enough that they're easily screened out in the pulping and screening processes, or they dissolve or become water soluble, you know, like a starch or some of the newer adhesives that are coming out that basically disperse uh, so that they can't linger in the fiber slurry and cause an issue like stickies or or strength loss. So that then that's another issue that's coming up more and more with new materials. You know, monomaterials are great, but water. Um, Fiber is water loving, so we're going so we need to put barrier uh, barriers on many of the products that we're innovating these days. So you look at coffee cups and ice cream containers, uh, and even something like a pizza label that has to go through a freeze thaw cycle. Um, but, you know, we need to add some chemistry to that paper. So that's where we're looking for that stays large and it's easily screened out, or becomes water soluble uh, and is removed. And and overarching over all of that is a eighty percent threshold. Uh, of fiber. So you need to make sure there's enough fiber in the material to make it worth uh, recycling. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting uh, work going on. 
Yeah, so that's interesting. From a consumer standpoint, you may not know it's a water-based tape, right? Versus a plastic tape. It just looks different and it looks printed. So I think being able to share with the consumer, um, remove tape or tape can be left on uh, is viable to get your material that you need as clean as possible into the stream uh, where it needs to go. Yeah, great point. And we see more and more coating suppliers and people like tape suppliers doing some pre-work so that they can pass on to their downstream customers. Hey, we've done some work and our coating on a representative roll of paper is fully recyclable with no issues. So that's that could certainly be done up front, uh, even by ingredient suppliers. Absolutely. Okay, let's roll into the next question. All right, so this one is for you, Blake. Um, approximately 26% and more of landfill is paper. How do we capture that and where does it go? Would it be the recycle stream or the compost stream? And then how do you find the best end of life scenario? Uh, okay, so the way we start capturing it is I guess we all just grab a shovel and start digging, right? To get it out. <laughs> um, the no the, the truth is I, I think the way we've got to capture it is is we have to divert it from landfills right in the first place we have to we have to slow that we have to slow the bleeding almost right um that 26 percent so if you think about it what what has changed in our economy and, and our market and you know societal 2017 uh back around 2017 in the recycled fiber market, there was about 58 million tons in circularity, right? So that meant that 58 million tons of recycled corrugate and fiber had been captured and was being moved from a, uh, you know, a producer to an end user, right? It was in that. So if you look at that number today, it's about 48 million. So it's gone down substantially. And one of the large contributing factors is the ever increase, I guess, ever reducing uh, impact of a consumer buying from a retailer is one of the largest contributions, right? So think about if you go to buy it at a Target, at a mall, or, or what have you, it's unpacked and it's put on the shelves. Well, there's processes in place to capture that cardboard and, and all of the storage materials. Uh, there's, you know, education behind it. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot less touch points. There's more, you know, uh, aggregated touch points to where that can get back into the recycling stream rather than being landfilled. So now when we have this, you know, it's, it's more and more and more and more and more every day, e-commerce direct to the consumer. We're going back to it again, to that education standpoint, right? Is it being captured? Is the effort being put there? Also, you know, there are uh, capture lanes, basically, that, you know, there's haulers and, and that are going directly to these you know, targets, these distribution centers, all these uh, to capture that, right? But if you're sending something from Amazon to a rural part of the, of the country, there may not be a MRF available to them. It may not be within striking distance. They may not have options to go to a transfer station, you know. There's certain parts of the country that are are much more keen on landfilling than than others, and and a lot of that just has to come down to access, really. You know, so we have an education and an access problem here, I think, we, especially, and it's it's just gotten worse, unfortunately, with the fact that it's more disparate and it's going directly to consumers now. Um, one thing we're trying to do, we as uh, GP Recycling, is you know, there's so I think Lon touched on it, but still you know we've we've got a decent rate of about 70 percent capture of the fiber so there's still a 30 percent opportunity there right um and a lot of that is still at these these large distribution centers these food packaging companies and such right but again that comes to access do they have access to someone who will put it into the recycling stream do they know who that is do they know what the process is do they have time for it right they have to run their business. Recycling is not their business. Recycling is a product of their business. So do they have time to be calling around to everybody to a hauler to come get it? 
to somebody to buy it, you know, or even take it at zero cost some in some cases. So we're we're trying to make SGP recycling in order in order to get more of the fiber into the waste stream. One of the things we've done is launch Hubit, our uh, online procurement procurement tool, uh, which hopefully is more of like an easy button where you can go on and you can see upfront pricing immediately for the material you have, and you can transact right then and there. So because what we learned is people were spending six hours of their day calling around trying to get a price and trying to find somebody to, to move this for them. So hopefully things like that will help. You know, another issue is also contamination, right? Contamination of the fiber. Um, having a landfill has been touched on a lot. So we've also been working on another technology that we call Juno. Uh, and it essentially comes alongside single stream recycling and can take the um, landfill stream and uh, sterilize that, sterilize, remove the contamination and sort the, the waste stream essentially. So we launched that recently, uh, a couple of years ago, we've been working on it for a long time and we're trying to scale that up as well to help with the contamination side of things. Um, but you know, the best in light, end of life scenario really depends on the product itself. Is it compostable? Is it recyclable? And then it depends on, you know, it, it's the best answer is it depends, right? Because then it depends on who's the last touch point, really. And part of it being compostable or recyclable from a consumer standpoint um, is really how clean that component is, right? So if it's a dirty pizza box um, or if you did get a layer of paper with that pizza in the box, you can get rid of that layer of paper and compost and hopefully still put the box in the, in the recycle stream. Yeah, and to Lon's point, we're getting better at, at capturing it and being able to salvage, we as, a, as the recycling industry, uh, Merck's are getting better at being able to salvage the pizza boxes specifically. But even if you go to like compostable, right? Uh, again, do we have a good system set up to get the compostable uh, materials to, uh, to the right um, avenues, right? If you, a lot of people have to pay for a compost service. Um, and, you know. Yeah, I think... I, your point of that about access Blake is is super important here because I think um when it comes to compostability specifically access to compost I mean we're talking about access to recycling here and issues with that access to compost is dramatically lower in the U.S. than it is to recycling right so like you know I don't I don't think you can necessarily look at compost for something like food packaging and be like oh, there's your silver bullet right we can just send it to compost because most folks don't have access to municipal composting service in the U.S. Um, you know, the last statistic I saw was something around like 10 to 12%. I mean, it's, it's minimal. Um, but you know, I think I, on top of that, I guess, thinking about where it goes, I think, I think Boyd, uh, kind of said it well, that it depends. I think ideally we want to capture usable, clean fiber as best as we can and keep it in the recycling loop as opposed to losing it to compost. Um, you know, and whatever we need to do to, to do that. But I think of the two, um, keeping that fiber in circulation would, would generally be preferable. Yeah, composting, yeah, is, I like the, sorry. composting is going to be a great solution for a lot of what we landfill someday when we build out the infrastructure. But right now we're kind of designing to an ideal rather than a reality, but it's coming. So I, I don't encourage people from doing that. But you, now we're adding another level of complexity in that composters don't want a clean, dry paper bowl. So there's another another situation there where the consumer is going to have to make that decision. Is it clean and dry where I should recycle it? Because that's the best use to keep that fiber in play and make that same bowl or a cardboard box five, six, seven, eight more times. Or is it food soiled and should go uh, to my compost bin? So another level of complexity and another opportunity. We've been talking a lot about the, the consumer choices and where they should be um, putting those items. Um, I'd just like to bring in another perspective there when we're talking about coffee cups, for example, or takeaway food um, packaging. In particular, when we're talking about specific venues, if we're thinking of concerts, sport venues, where you have um, in one evening, in one day or a weekend, a huge amount of consumption of paper cups, paper plates, salad bowls, and what have you. 
And I think those would be a fantastic opportunity to say, okay, these could be um, streams that would go to compost. As was said in my introduction, I really do believe in, in a more sustainable future. And if we say, we have these venues where um, all that um, potentially garbage that would otherwise go to landfill could be sorted a little bit and people put uh, cups into specific containers and there's some great initiatives in terms of designing collection containers for paper cups and for other, for other items. Um, paper cup recycling is very possible if they are collected separately, for example, but then those items that are soiled because they still have the grease from the pizza or the ketchup and the mustard attached to them, no paper recycling facility wants to have those. So those can then absolutely go to a composting stream. So um, I think in the, in the hospitality sector, in particular in venues where you have a large amount of materials um, being used and consumed in, uh, in a short period of time, that's where those waste streams could very well be diverted to compost rather than going to, going to landfill. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity that um, venues hopefully could, uh, could explore in, in greater detail in order to divert that garbage from landfill and, and have it go to compost. Those venues might be great to be able to educate as well so that people are like, oh, okay, so I should be doing this at home too. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Again, coming back to the education mm -hmm. and um, at those sorts of venues, um, that would also be a great opportunity to, uh, to teach the audience a little bit about how to recycle. Absolutely. Well, to that point, I mean, you saw during the, I think it was in January or February, there was one of the games, one of the football games that there was a ton of snow and they paid like the the viewers to come and shovel the snow out of the stadium. Well, you have consumers who are are willing to participate in that way. If they're willing to shovel piles and piles of snow, you better believe they're going to be ready to participate in uh, making that particular event a little more uh, eco-friendly. And honestly, the, the the artists and the venue managers they can make those, they can put numbers to those, right? They can tie the numbers back to the ticket value. They can tie the numbers back to the, the, the economic impact of that event. You don't want to go crazy, but the opportunities are there. So it's kind of cool to hear about it in terms of venues, actually. What are the originating sources of these waste streams? Uh, so that's a really good point, Elizabeth. Right, but to Elizabeth's point, right, we got to meet them where they're at. Right. Yeah. And them, I mean, the attendees. So we can't just put a blue basket out there and expect it to. Right. You're going to get a lot of hot dogs, half eaten hot dogs. <laughs> right. So it does come down to, you know, you really got to. I hate to say it, but sometimes solve for the lowest common denominator, you know, make it straightforward. This goes here and this goes there. And it's it's so rarely that I see that done well, especially in a public setting. Right. Uh, it's clear that we need, you know, plastics and metals in this one and, you know, fiber in this one and everything else in this one. Right. So it, I think it, it just, we got to educate. We got to be better about education. We got to be more frequent with education. We got to be more broad with education and just keep hammering it in. That's good. And to that, to that point, Gordon, I just want to add one more point to that before we go on to the next question. There have been some studies done in terms of if consumers feel that they are being watched when they are putting um, the items into, uh, into the bins and selecting what goes where, if they have the impression that they're being watched, they're going to be more conscientious about their choices that they're making rather than if they feel that they're not being watched and the bin is in some dark corner, then they'll just throw it in wherever. So that's, a, that's an interesting component for that one as well. Maybe we do need cameras and... <laughs> Smart cameras that know the material that's coming and it goes, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It increased the level of paranoia and will increase our recyclability. <laughs> that's good. That's actually a good point, Elizabeth. It's actually, I mean, that peer pressure, the healthy peer pressure yeah. is, I think, a very important aspect. This was this particular one was really engaging. I, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, and this one's kind of a three-part. Uh, Elizabeth, this isn't going to go to you. Um, how would you improve adhesives for fiber-based packaging processes? What do those adhesives and starches do 
in a paper fiber recycling plant, some of which we've been talking about. I, I really wanted to get to this question earlier when, uh, when, when Lon was talking about this, but like, here we are now. And what innovations do you see coming down the line in this regard? This is a great three-part question and there's so much to talk about here. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, in terms of improving the adhesives and the fiber-based uh, packaging processes, I think we need to take a step back and think about all the different types of adhesives that are being used in fiber-based in, in fiber uh, packaging processes. I mean, it starts with the adhesive that is used to make corrugated, um, the adhesive that is used to um, put in the side seams to put packaging together down to hot melts that are then used to close um, cases and cartons. And then of course the labels that have also been touched on um, which are omnipresent nowadays with e-commerce and, and all the shipments. Um, there's more discussion about uh, tracking shipments with RFID labels, et cetera, et cetera. So if anything, we're gonna have more labels rather than rather than fewer labels. And I think it all starts with the, the proper use of adhesives. Um, we do a lot of internal testing. We have the complete um, equipment set up to do uh, fiber box association test part one and two, and also the, the European harmonized testing method, the CEPI, um, to be able to do um, both parts of that testing as well. So we see it really makes a difference if you are applying the proper amount of adhesive um, some people think, you know, more adhesive makes it stick better and then you get a better result, but that's really not the case. You want to use the, the correct amount of adhesive in order to also have um, processes run as, um, as best as possible. And if you think of the um, carton processing, uh, corrugated manufacturing, etc., these are all processes that run extremely fast. So the adhesives have all been developed and specially formulated to um, run as flawlessly as possible on these very fast production lines um, without any stringing, without any spraying to run as, as cleanly as possible. So that's, so that's the first point. Use the correct amount of adhesive rather than, rather than overdoing it. We've of course been talking about various innovations, barrier coatings, when we're talking about replacements of um, plastics by papers that by nature do not have any barrier properties. So those have to be added to the paper with coatings, which has been mentioned, which then don't necessarily facilitate, um, facilitate recycling. So what we are also doing at HP Fuller is we're studying very carefully the various raw materials that are used in the various chemistries, in particular water-based um, adhesives, in order to see the impact that that then has on the recyclability and on the testing results that we are getting, so that we can get a better handle on how to be formulating in the future. Because um, as was said at the beginning, paper recycling has been happening for 10,000 years, roughly, um, but <clears throat> So it's been happening for a very long time. Paper mills have been able to deal with it. Doesn't mean that they're particularly happy um, when they have huge black blotches on their, um, on their paper and have to cut that out and stop and restart, um, stop their, their paper lines. So in terms of what adhesives and starches do in the paper fiber recycling plants, I think Lon was touching on that earlier in terms of saying that much of the water-based adhesives will um, dissolve and um, go into the go into the water, um, but that's not but that's not what a hundred percent of uh, that happens because again the the repulping process can be very short and um, even if it's at uh, at higher water temperatures, sort of you know warm bath or sort of a hot bathtub base, uh, temperature basically. Um, not all of the adhesive is going to dissolve, and it's only the, the bigger pieces of hot melt adhesives, the packaging hot melt adhesives that can be um, that can be taken out in the in the sieves and that uh, repulping stage. So it's really about the water-based adhesives that then wash out um, when the fibers are cleaned and put through the sieves. Um, some adhesives also will come out at a de-inking station. Um, but then there is a small component together with the other chemistry that inherently is in paper as well, 
um, that then ends up in the in the recycled paper to then um, create secondary stickies, and that's then where the issues come. You can have some buildup on the on the paper machines, which then um, necessitates additional cleaning steps, and of course um, that um, costs money and resources, and they slow slow down the the production process there. So that's really where we need to say, okay. Um, what are the specific components in the adhesives and um, chemicals and the paper making process, the starches, et cetera, and all the other re, um, um, contaminants that are in the fiber um, in the recycling process and make their way all the way into the new recycled paper? Um, and how can we then formulate new adhesives that then? Um, Hopefully, we will not have all of these components in there and then bit by bit um, reduce the disproportion, although it's already um, fairly small. Um, and Lone was uh, referring to that previously that the testing for innovations is absolutely essential. That when we are looking at new innovations, whether this is um, barrier coatings, making sure that um, we can have pizza cartons without PFAS in them, all these sorts of types of applications, um, that then we make sure that the recyclability has been tested before those products are put onto the market. And I think um, customers, our customers that we are working with on these types of innovations, as well as ourselves, are very conscientious about this type of testing, very aware of the necessity to, to test in advance. Um, in terms of other innovations, besides the um, replacement of plastic applications with paper, I do see um, the possibility of using new raw materials, more natural um, raw materials. Starches, of course, are, are natural. And we see many developments in, um, in various bio-based raw materials right now. Those um, raw materials, the production of those raw materials are still very much in their infancy, but there's a tremendous amount of research and innovation ongoing in that area so that within the next five, 10 years, we really see that um, changing significantly. That's really where I see the innovation going is the replacing plastic applications with paper but then also the raw material compositions changing as well when more raw materials become available to use the overall. That's good. Uh, do you, our other panelists have any kind of things to add to that perspective? I'll jump on a little bit to the third part of that question with the innovations that we see coming. And, you know, my theme's kind of been these new materials because that's a lot of what we see. Um, but, you know, we, Elizabeth talked about how a lot of these, if they break down, will end up in the water system when we're talking about starches or adhesives. And that's really can be a, a tipping point in the end of the story uh, for these type of chemicals. Because if that is a fossil fuel based um, polymer, that does not biodegrade, it ends up, you know, in a sludge tank and ends up in landfill. And just to be clear, all paper mills now when they're doing recycling or virgin, they have their own waste treatment on plant on site for their water or water treatment plant. So yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna settle out that sludge, which may have that plastic or poly-based polymer. Uh, and then that does end up in landfill. So you still have the issue of potentially of microplastics and where do those go? Uh, if that's a bio-based polymer, and keep in mind that not all bio-based polymers will biodegrade, but many will. So if you have a biodegradable bio-based polymer, uh, it, it's basically BOD or biological oxygen demand that with time, with oxygen and microbes uh, in the settling ponds or aeration ponds of the water treatment plant, these will break down into CO2 and a bit of biomass and water. So that's really the, you know, the best scenario and where we see this growth uh, in biodegradable plastics and bioplastics that's really exciting. That's good. Blake or Brad, anything to add? I guess I'll, I'll just I'll just add. I think Elizabeth alluded to it well at the end of her um, answer uh, there. But um, this whole I guess move towards paper in in packaging formats that have traditionally been plastic or something else. Um, you know, I think doing that in a way that is environmentally thoughtful, using methods like life cycle assessment and others to avoid, you know, 
any sort of greenwashing or anything when those moves are being made, I think is, is really, really critical. Um, but yeah, I think other than that, both Lon and Elizabeth, or excuse me, Elizabeth have covered it well. Okay. Yeah. And, and I already touched on, you know, Juno, what we're trying to do about decontaminating um, some of the recyclable materials that are, you know, the effort there, right. Is to meet the cons whomever's throwing it away at the time to meet them where they're at, right? If there's a lack of education or unknowing or accident, whatever, throw it away. If you throw it away, we're still going to capture it. That's the hope with right, Juno. Um, and of course, with across Georgia Pacific as a whole, uh, we have a, a whole bunch of initiatives done by people that are far smarter than me uh, in just exactly what Elizabeth's talking about. And how can we replace plastic with fiber, you know, with something more, a little more environmentally friendly, a little more, um, yeah, I guess we could say more recyclable, right? Um, but then in terms of what I can speak to is on the market side of things, right? Um, innovations that are coming down the pike that I think are critical are going to be about activating, um, I don't want to call them recycling dead zones, but, you know, when you think about it, the further you get away from an urban area, into a more rural area, um, you see recycling rates just de decrease. And it, it, I keep, I'm beating a dead horse here, but it's accessibility and it's accessibility to uh, services, accessibilities to technologies, uh, accessibility to information, to a buyer, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, so that's where we, we hope that we are helping uplift the market and uh, activating players into the recycling stream, right? It's activating new suppliers that would otherwise be landfilling it or where we would, you know, it would fall off the back end. We would lose that fiber that could otherwise go into the recycling stream. Great, thank you everybody for all of the input on that last question. Uh, we've got about uh, five minutes for Q&A, and uh, we've left you with a couple of quotes. I'll let everyone go ahead and read those in their leisure rather than go through them. So uh, for the question and answer piece, do we have some input from our participants in the chat? I'm unable to see it. I don't see anything yet. Uh, for those who are attending, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen and our, our panelists will be happy to answer those for you. Okay, and while we're waiting for those questions, I am going to let each of the presenters uh, give the best way to contact them if you've got questions or want any more information. Um, so let's start with Elizabeth, if you could share the best way to get a hold of you with the crowd? The best way to get a hold of me is probably email, just because I'm based in Europe and with the time difference, um, it's easiest to get, get me on email. So it's elizabeth.stob, as you see it here on the screen, at hdfuller.com. And I look forward to any questions and follow up clues you may have. Thank you. So that's elizabethstob at hbfuller.com. And Lon, Shigoda, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, so either uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, which may be the easiest and keep you from having to spell my last name, or it's lon.shigoda at wmich edu. But either way, I'm happy to, to connect and uh, talk through projects or testing or whatever might be on your mind anytime. Great, thank you. And Blake, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, I think LinkedIn is a great way. Uh, I would agree there, but uh, email, certainly great. Uh, that's just blake.gordon at gapac.com. Um, if you want to learn more about Hubbit, which I mentioned is our online procurement tool where you can you know, go on, find a price and, and sell um, directly to GP Recycling, your recycled material, that's Hubbit, H-U-B-B-I-T, gpr.com, all one word. And if you want to learn more about G GP Recycling, Georgia Pacific Recycling, it's uh, gapacrecycling.com. So many different ways to reach me. Excellent. And Brad, how shall we reach you? 
Yeah, so I'll uh, echo what Lon said. Let's uh, try to avoid having to spell my last name if at all possible. Um, you can contact me on uh, Also, you know, feel free to reach out to um, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition email as a whole. Um, our website is sustainablepackaging.org. Um, we're going to be launching some new fiber-focused work this summer that we're looking for folks to get involved with. So um, watch the watch the website, watch my LinkedIn, um, and yeah, happy to connect. Excellent. All right. The MIA, I'm also on LinkedIn, of course. Yes, yeah, so you can find Nehemiah and myself on LinkedIn as well. If you want to learn more about our companies or what we do, we're, we're happy to even help connect you back to the panelists if, if that's uh, something you need help with. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. Do we have any questions in on chat? Uh, no, nope. We don't have anything from our audience. I think they've been well informed. You all as panelists have been very clear, super informative. This has been an incredible panel to sit through. Um, all of you clearly know your stuff. You're clearly passionate about this topic. And um, it, it, it sounds like the, the work that you're doing is particularly meaningful. Um, actually, as, as I was talking just now, uh, we had one question, uh, and maybe we can close with this question actually, because we're just about at time. The question is, how is the industry getting prepared for recycling more complex structures with laminations or coatings using plastics or bio-based agents? Read that question again. Some of this was addressed, but if you can speak specifically to how is the industry getting prepared for recycling more complex structures with laminations or coatings using plastics or bio-based agents? I'll just um, start in on that. We see that in the work that we're doing with uh, with Forever Green here in Europe. Um, and I would expect that it's also similar in the US in terms of um, recycling technology being developed by the um, equipment producers that supply um, recyclers, um, MRFs and paper mills alike. And so from that perspective, having that sortation and then having those materials that are more complex go to these specialty mills that have this state-of-the-art recycling um, possibilities, that's really where it needs to go in order to be able to capture the fibers from those materials. Good. So the solutions, solutions are there, the solutions are coming, but at the end of the day, I think it's been very clear in this, in this, in this panel discussion, it does boil down to economics. Good. Uh, any other last words on that question or uh, on as we close up from the rest of our panel? Wrap that one up. We touched on a lot of the pieces uh, that are the answer to that question, and there certainly is no silver bullet, but it's consumer behavior and some education that has to take place. Uh, it's consumers uh, making the right decisions and being active in what they do, whether that's through peer pressure or other or monetary reimbursement or whatever program uh, ends up working for that. And then it's the technology that's doing the sortation. So can that optic that tells you if that's a paper or plastic tell if that's a barrier coating on a paper-based hmm. product? So there's going to have to be some uh, high-tech work done, done behind the scenes as well. So, yep, not a silver bullet, but a lot of great people are involved in that effort. So there's hope. That's great. Katie? Yes. So we want to thank all of our panelists today for joining us. We really appreciate all of your wisdom uh, and answering these questions for us and sharing your knowledge. We appreciate you. Uh, for everybody that has participated and is online, uh, we have a one pager for each of the panelists and their companies that uh, you'll be able to uh, review at uh, a later date as soon as this broadcast is complete. Uh, we will post that out along with the uh, panelist speaker information. So you will have some more information at your fingertips and you can also reach out via LinkedIn as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Nehemiah, for co-hosting. It's been a great afternoon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. And watch for our next installment in our series of packaging recycling. Thank you very much for joining. Have a great day.
Thanks. Have a great day all. Bye-bye.